Hi everyone. In this video I will be demonstrating how to perform a multiple linear regression using SPSS. And this presentation is not designed to be um, exhaustive in every aspect of linear regression, but just to basically provide you with a general walkthrough on how to generate regression output and also how to interpret some of that output. So the data set that you see on your screen, this is just fictional student data. Basically we have 70 cases where we have students who are enrolled in a math class. And what we'll be doing is predicting uh, math achievement as a function of four predictor variables. So the predictors in the model are going to include interest, engagement, anxiety, and gender identification. And you'll notice that uh, all of these variables right here, all of these are scale variables in SPSS, and we're basically going to be treating these as, um, as interval scaled. This gender ID variable right here, this is a dichotomous variable. You'll notice that I've got value uh, codes or values of 0 and 1. Values of 0 indicate that a student identified as male. A value of 1 indicates that a student identified as female. And you may uh, think to yourself, why would we be able to incorporate uh, a dichotomous variable in the model? And the fact of the matter is, is that you can incorporate dichotomous um, predictors in your regression model. It's a common misconception that you can only use continuous predictors, but there's no assumption regarding um, uh, that, that the predictors have to be continuous. So we can incorporate dichotomous um, predictors in our model. If it was a case that we had a multi-categorical variable, one where we had say a nominal or ordinal variable uh, with more than three levels, then what we would need to do is to recode that uh, multi-categorical variable into a set of dichotomous variables for inclusion in the model. So we can actually incorporate factor variables into our regression with appropriate uh, recoding of that factor variable. So at any rate, you'll find this data set at the link that's provided underneath the video description. So you can download the data to follow along. You'll also find a link to a supplemental PowerPoint that you might find uh, helpful uh, when it comes to uh, learning about interpretation of the results and so forth. So I'm going to go ahead and get started by going to Analyze, go down or scroll down to Regression, and then click on Linear. And I'm going to move the dependent variable achievement to the dependent box and I'm going to remove the main remaining predictors over to the independence box right here um, where it says statistics I'm going to select descriptives part and partial correlations collinearity diagnostics and confidence intervals and uh, the selection of confidence intervals what this is going to do is it's going to give me confidence intervals for the, reg the regression parameters in the model the uh, descriptives is, are just going to give me the means and standard deviations and sample sizes for the uh, predictors. The part and partial correlations uh, are a way of assessing the relationship between the predictors or independent variables and the dependent variable within the model. And then we have collinearity diagnostics which uh, are useful for evaluating whether we have some problems with uh, highly uh, correlated predictors and collinearity leads to various problems when it comes to uh, interpretation of the, of the results. So I'm going to click on continue here. We'll click next on plots and one of the things I can do is request a residuals plot. So for this I'm going to move this SRE SID, these are referring to studentized residuals. I'm going to move them to the this uh, Y box right here and then this ZPRED. Uh, this is referring to predicted values on the dependent variable but are scaled in Z scores, so are converted to Z scores. So I'm going to move those predicted values to the X uh, box right here. So this is going to produce a residuals plot with the residuals plotted against the predicted values on the dependent variable. Uh, next, I'm going to select histogram and normal probability plot. So you'll see right here, uh, this says standardized residuals plot. And so just keep in mind that with linear regression, uh, the procedure makes uh, several, a, a, a number of different assumptions. Uh, three of the main assumptions are independence of the residuals, um, then we have normality of the residuals and then also the assumption of constant variance or homoskedasticity. So 
The residuals plots are uh, particularly useful for evaluating that normality assumption and also you can use them uh, to eyeball the data in order to identify potential uh, residual outliers. The residuals plot that you see right up here that we're going to be generating can also be useful for evaluating some of these assumptions, um, in particular uh, eyeballing the data for evidence of non-constant variance, uh, looking for potential outliers, and you can also uh, sometimes pick up on non-linearities in the residuals plot as well. I'm also going to select produce all partial plots and basically what uh, these are are plots of the relationship our relationships between the independent variables and the dependent variable controlling for all of the remaining independent variables within the model. So you can kind of think of this as a visualization of the partial correlation uh, between each independent variable and the dependent variable, basically where you partialed out the other independent variables. So we'll click on continue and if I go under save I've got various options for saving new variables to the data set and a lot of these are useful for diagnostic purposes so I'm going to select for instance predicted values right here and unstandardized residuals so keep in mind that when I select predicted values um, it's going to generate a predicted value on the dependent variable for each case in the data set and uh, so that's each person's predicted score on math achievement. And then the residuals, the unstandardized residuals, um, are nothing more than the difference between the predicted uh, values on the dependent variable or predicted achievement and their actual score on achievement. Um, you'll see too that we have studentized residuals that we can select right here. Uh, we, we could theoretically use standardized or studentized residuals. There's a couple of other uh, variants as well. And in, in particular, we can use some of these standardized or studentized residuals for the purposes of identifying potential uh, residual outliers in our data set. The, uh, where it says distances, we could select Mahalanobis and Cooks right here. And where it says influence statistics, we can select standardized DF betas. So uh, I'm not really going to be talking about these in any real sense in this particular video. I, I address these um, these measures in other videos. Uh, but just to note that uh, the Mahalanobis distance uh, is used to identify potential outliers on the set of predictor variables. So basically cases that have um, greater leverage um, in, in the data set. So then you can see that we have Cook's D right there and where it says influence statistics, we have the standardized DF betas. And both of these are useful for identifying those cases that may be exerting uh, higher undue influence in the regression model. So one of the, I, one of the um, basic tenets of our uh, analysis is, or one of the preferences that we have, is that we want each of the cases or all of the cases to sort of contribute similarly uh, to the overall regression solution. And if we have cases that uh, exert undue influence, that means that we have kind of a subset of cases that are dominating um, what we find in our output in terms of the regression uh, fit. So at any rate, we have Cook's D and standardized D of betas. Those are useful uh, for identifying potentially uh, or highly influential cases. So next, we'll click on continue right here. Just kind of FYI, if you go under options, you'll see that um, in, in particular, it says missing values down here. Uh, by default, the program excludes cases list-wise. That means that if there are any missing uh, values for a case on any of the variables, then that case would be excluded uh, from the analysis. So that's what list-wise deletion will do for you. Uh, there are two other approaches um, uh, in terms of dealing with missing data. You have the option for pairwise deletion, and you also have the option for replace with mean. So uh, we're going to stick with the list-wise approach and click on continue right here and then on OK to generate our output. So uh, first off, you know, because we had clicked on those save buttons under the save menu, you can see right here we have predicted values. These are the unstandardized residuals, basically the difference between the predicted values on achievement and um, the predicted values, so are predicted in actual values. So there's actual achievement, predicted values. So the difference 
these uh, is reflected in this column of unstandardized residuals. Uh, this column right here contains the studentized residuals for each case. There's Mihalanobis distance, Cook's D, and so and then we have this uh, standardized DF beta. So all of this, these additional variables that are added to the data set right here are due to the fact that we had gone under uh, the save button right here and that's where they're located. So if you didn't want to generate those you can easily just um, leave those uh, clicked off. And by the way too you can also delete these variables if you don't want to include them in the data set. So now let's go ahead and take a look at our output. So I'm going to go under the output here and you'll see first off we had requested descriptive statistics for our variables so you can see that we have the means and standard deviations for uh, our achievement, interest, engagement, anxiety, and gender ID variables. Uh, you can also see that we have the sample sizes and um, we had actually are working with a complete data set so there was no deletion of any cases due to missing data uh, but uh, had there been missing data on you know one or more variables for certain cases and those cases would have been excluded and our sample size would not be 70 they would be uh, whatever number of cases had complete data then we have uh, our correlation matrix right here so these are the correlations um, involving the uh, independent variables and the dependent variable. You'll see in this first row right here we have the achievement variable. That's our dependent variable. And you can see that um, the correlation between student interest and achievement. This is a zero order correlation, meaning that we're not parceling out any other variables from that association. Uh, we have correlation of 0.514. That's a, a pretty strong correlation right there. We have a correlation between achievement and engagement of 0.503. Between achievement and anxiety, it's negative 0.324. So that's more of a a medium-sized correlation and then um, with respect to gender identification the correlation is 0 0.209 and the way to make sense out of that gender identification correlation um, is to go back and re and think about the the way we coded that variable so a value of 0 indicated that a person identified as male a value of 1 indicates that a person identified as female so if we have a positive correlation as we do right here then that would suggest that females are scoring higher on achievement than males. Um, with respect to the interest engagement relationship there was a positive correlation of 0.39 between interest and anxiety the correlation is negative 0.266 and between interest and gender ID we have a positive correlation again given that coding that would suggest that uh, students identifying as female scored higher on interest than those identifying as male with respect to the engagement and anxiety relationship uh, it, the correlation is negative uh, 0.287 and the correlation between um, our engagement and gender identification uh, is basically a positive relationship it's a small positive relationship of 0.143 uh, once again thinking about our coding that would indicate that uh, individuals identifying as female scored higher on engagement than those identifying as male and then finally if we look at the correlation between anxiety and gender ID right here we have a negative correlation suggesting in this case that females were actually scoring lower on anxiety than uh, persons identified as male uh, so we'll scroll on down and you can see we have our regression results. So keep in mind in multiple regression what we're going to be doing is evaluating the overall fit, basically the contribution of the full set of predictors um, in terms of explaining variation in the dependent variable and then from that then we proceed to looking at each of the individual predictors in terms of their contributions to the model. So the first question then is you know do this does the set of predictors account for significant variation in the dependent variable and so that's where we would be looking at the model summary and this ANOVA table right here so just keep in mind too that essentially what we're doing is we're taking all of this information from our predictors we had four predictors we had x1 x2 uh, we'll just say x3 and x4 uh, referring basically to interest, engagement, anxiety, and gender ID. And we're taking that information and from that we are generating a new variable 
which is the predicted values on Y. So if you remember, I was talking about that column of predicted values. Well, the predicted values on Y, or Y hat, these are um, essentially those values on the dependent variable that are uh, predicted by you know how how people scored on the uh, predictor variables or the values on the predictor variables so we're essentially generating predicted values on y or fitted values you'll also hear them referred to as conditional means so this is essentially a new variable that has been created from this, the information contained in our original set and then we are relating those predicted values to the actual values and so that's how we are essentially evaluating the overall fit of our model. So we want to know if the relationship between the fitted and actual values on Y, uh, what the nature of that relationship is. Is it you know, a strong relationship or a weak relationship? And then also, is it significantly different from zero? So if we look in our model summary table, you'll notice first off we've got this index right here called R. And the R is referred to as the multiple correlation. So it's a correlation between the set of our predictor variables and the actual scores on Y. And so the vehicle then, again, is that we are uh, taking that information from the original set of predictors and generating a new variable, which is our fitted uh, variable right here, fitted Y variable, and then we're correlating fitted Y with actual Y. So the multiple correlation ranges on a scale between 0 and 1. Okay, So there are no negative correlations when we're talking about the multiple correlation. So we interpret though the magnitude of that relationship using the same general approach that we do when we are working with the standard Pearson's correlation. So as you can see right here, as we would uh, if we have a value that's closer to 0, that's indicating that we have a low relationship between the fitted Y values and the actual Y values. As we move closer to 1, we have a stronger relationship between those two. And so a stronger relationship then would signal then that we have a stronger relationship between the set of the uh, independent variables and the dependent variable. So you can see right here the multiple uh, correlation is 0.629, which is a good size correlation uh, indicating a strong relationship between um, fitted Y and actual Y. Then the next part of our output we have this R square right here. So unsurprisingly that is just uh, computed by taking the square of the multiple correlation. So the R square value is also, or R square is also referred to as the coefficient of determination and it represents the proportion of variation in Y accounted for by the set of predictors. So here you'll see that we have a value of point 395, which indicates that the predictors are accounting for about 39.5% of the variation in math achievement. So that's a pretty good amount of variation that's being accounted for. So then you'll see uh, below we have this ANOVA summary table, which uh, is used to test, uh, or basically test a null hypothesis, uh, either that the multiple correlation is equal to zero or the, that the uh, R-square or coefficient of determination uh, is equal to zero. The alternative hypothesis uh, in those cases are that the multiple correlation is greater than zero or the R-square value is greater than zero. And basically the same F-test is addressing um, uh, either of those um, ways of talking about the relationship between the fitted and actual Y values. So down here you can see that we have FA that's given and uh, you can see that we have the p-value for the f-test that's given right here and by the way I'm working with SPSS version 28 and so one of the new additions it looks like is that now instead of providing 0 .001 for the significance level um, if in those cases where the value is less than 0 .001 they're actually providing a less than sign so that's kind of a cool little addition right there it's a small change but it's pretty nifty um, so at any rate, because we find statistical significance for our uh, F-test, then we would infer that the multiple correlation is greater than zero in the population and also that the uh, population R-square is greater than zero. Another thing to kind of point out too is that we can compute the R-square um, from the ANOVA summary table, so some of the information contained there. 
basically, if you look at the sums of squares column right here, uh, column right here, you'll see where the the total uh, variation in our dependent variable achievement is broken down into uh, variation that's due to the regression and variation that's due to prediction error. So the sums of squares in our regression model is additive. So in other words, if you think about it, if I take the total sum of squares um, for my dependent variable, I'll just say SS tote right here for total, um, the sum of squares total is equal to 588.73 and if I the sum of squares due to the regression uh, is basically you know contained right here I'll just put kind of break this out there's sum of squares due to the regression and then we have the sum of squares due to the total so I'll just say S excuse me sum of squares due to the prediction error that's the variation that's not accounted for so those two components those two sums of squares are additive so we can then form uh, a ratio of the sum of squares regression to the sum of squares total and that ratio then gets us the R square value that you see uh, in the model summary table the other thing to point out too looking at our output is we have an adjusted R square that's given in the model summary table and the reason why this matters is that you know when we're trying to talk about the R square and use that as an estimator of the population R square uh, we have to keep in mind that that estimator the R square tends to be positively biased and it's going to be particularly biased in those cases where we have uh, smaller sample size with larger numbers of predictors so the adjusted R square is reflecting an adjustment to that estimate to provide a better calibrated estimate of the R square value in the population. So at this point we've determined that we have a significant um, relationship between the set of predictors or set of independent variables and the dependent variable. So now we can go down to the coefficients table and look at the contributions of the predictors in the model. So looking first off in this first row you'll see it says constant and that is the intercept for our uh, regression model and the intercept is nothing more than the predicted value on y when all of our predictors are equal to zero. So under a lot of circumstances people don't spend much time uh, interpreting the intercept or trying to make sense out of it um, but this can provide valuable information in those cases where zero is you know falls within the range of uh, theoretical or observed values on the predictor variables. So the gender ID variable right here, uh, remember we had coded uh, persons identifying as male as zero, persons identifying as female uh, with a one. And so if, if, if it was the case that the other predictors all uh, theoretically could have incorporated zero into those uh, into those uh, scales, uh, then essentially the intercept would ref would uh, be the predicted value on math achievement for persons identified as male who scored at the at zero on the other predictors within the model it turns out that I didn't um, you know zero did not fall within the range of values on those predictor variables so for all intents and purposes it doesn't you know hold a lot of informational value uh, as it is right here so this column though of B these are the regression parameters and so we just talked about the uh, intercept if we go down now we have the regression slopes these are called unstandardized partial regression slopes and the reason why they're called partial regression slopes is that uh, we are looking at the effect of uh, each of the independent variables on the dependent variable while partialing out the influence of the other predictors or partialing out the associations involving the other uh, predictor variables. So with respect to interest right here the unstandardized uh, partial regression slope is 0.314 and what that basically means is is that for every one unit increase on interest there's a predicted increase of 0.314 units with respect to achievement or we could also say that uh, two persons uh, two individuals or two cases uh, that differ by one uh, raw score unit on interest differ by about 0.314 uh, units on achievement and this is also holding all of the remaining predictors constant in the model 
So we have a positive predictive relationship between interest and achievement. And you can see over here that we have a test of that relationship. So we, this is given uh, as a t-test right here. So the t-value that you see right here of 3.187, this is formed as a ratio of the unstandardized regression slope to its standard error. So that gets us the, t the observed t-value that you see in this table. And then from that uh, is derived the p-value, which is contained in this sig column right here. So if we adopt a conventional alpha level of 0 0.05, then in this case, we would say that the, that interest is a positive and significant predictor of achievement. When we look at the uh, next um, predictor, engagement, we have 0.317. So we have a positive predictive relationship between engagement and achievement. And we can also see, once again, that uh, this uh, relationship is statistically significant. For anxiety, we have a negative regression slope, and that's indicating that uh, students scoring higher on anxiety tended to score lower in terms of achievement. But you'll see over here that uh, the test of significance um, is indicating that uh, basically that anxiety is not a significant predictor in the model. And then with respect to gender ID, we have a positive regression slope right here. Uh, keeping in mind the coding of that variable of 0 and 1, where uh, 1 represents persons identifying as female, that positive coefficient would be indicating that females are scoring higher on uh, achievement than uh, those identifying as male. But that relationship is also non-significant. So it turns out that we have two significant predictors within our model. Now in terms of uh, over here you can see that we have a confidence interval associated with each of those um, regression parameters that are being estimated. So in a nutshell as we're looking at this you can see that this is the confidence interval uh, formed around uh, the, uh, the unstandardized regression slope. So you have to keep in mind the unstandardized regression slopes those are all point estimates of the population uh, regression slopes and the confidence intervals really kind of provide us a, a little bit of wiggle room when it comes to uh, the estimate. So instead of looking at uh, the effect in terms of a single point estimate, we can look at the effect using a range of, of, of possible values. So at any rate, I kind of discussed this in more detail within the PowerPoint, so I'm not going to belabor that point in this um, discussion, but you can see right here, these are the 95% confidence intervals associated with each of the predictor variables. Next, you'll see we have um, correlations that are given. So the first column are zero order correlations between each of our independent variables and the dependent variable. And all of these correlations were found in that first row of the correlations output that I was showing you earlier on. So if I kind of uh, scroll up here, you can see that those are the same values that are displayed right here in this row in our output. Okay, so those are zero order correlations. Uh, basically reflecting uh, the relationship between each independent variable and the dependent variable without controlling for the other predictors. The partial column that you see right here, these are partial correlations. These are correlations between each of the independent variables and the dependent variable. Partialing out the effect of the other predictors uh, or the other uh, independent variables from that association. So in other words, think about it this way, that Essentially, the partial correlation for interest um, reflects the relationship between interest and achievement after removing uh, the overlapping variation that interest and achievement both share with the remaining independent variables. Then finally, we have this part column right here. These are referred to as semi-partial correlations or part correlations. And these reflect the unique association between each of the independent variables and the dependent variable. And so the partialing uh, that occurs is of the independent variables. Uh, each independent variable is uh, partialed or uh, residualized for the remaining independent variables in the model. But the dependent variable 
uh, remains intact. So if I was to square these semi-partial correlations right here, basically obtaining the squared semi-partial correlations, then they would each give me the proportion of unique variation in the dependent variable accounted for by each of the independent variables. So that's a useful index a lot of times to evaluate uh, this, the size of the contributions of each of the uh, independent variables. Then finally, you can see right here we have collinearity statistics. And so these are, uh, again, utilized to, ident to uh, identify those uh, variables that might be uh, collinear with other uh, variables within the model. And more specifically, uh, I'm talking about the independent variables. So you can see right here that we have two collinearity statistics. We have tolerance and VIF. VIF is referring to the variance inflation factor. And so there are various rules of thumb out there uh, concerning uh, what constitutes evidence of collinearity. Uh, a common rule of thumb, and we'll just stick mainly with the VIF, um, a common rule of thumb is a VIF greater than uh, 10 for a given predictor signals that that predictor is uh, collinearity with collinear with one or more of the uh, other uh, predictors or independent variables within the model. And so it turns out as you're looking at this, none of those values even remotely approaches 10. And so it looks like there's no real substantial evidence of collinearity uh, going on among the independent variables within our model. So we'll scroll down a little bit further and you can see that we have output such as um, it, you know we have this table of residual statistics and then we have our histogram of the residuals and a normal uh, PP plot of the residuals and so this plot right here the histogram and the normal PP plot again these are useful for evaluating that assumption concerning normality of the residuals and they can also be useful for identifying uh, potential outliers with respect to the residuals. If we scroll down a little bit further you can see that we have a, the residuals plot so this is a plot of the studentized residuals against the standardized predicted values so basically the predicted y values are converted to z values and so um, what we're looking for is just a random display of data points within this plot. We we don't want to see any kind of evidence of any kind of uh, clustering or uh, any kind of pattern with respect to the residuals such as like a fan shape or anything like that. Um, if we exhibited a pattern such as a fan shape then that might be an ev by that would be some indication of potential uh, violation of that assumption of constant variance. So in other words we would have uh, potential evidence of heteroscedasticity. Uh, we can also use this plot to identify potential outliers. If I scroll down a little bit further you'll see that I've got partial regression plots. Uh, these are also referred to as added variable plots and basically they allow us to look at the relationship or visualize the relationship between each independent variable and the dependent variable controlling for the other independent variables in the model. And if I wanted to I could double click in here and I can add a fit line. If I go over here uh, up here to the top it says add fit line at total. When I click on that it's fitting a uh, straight line to uh, to the data right there and if I want to remove the, the equation from that line I can just click off of attach label to line and then click on add, uh, apply right here and it removes that. You'll see we also have other uh, options that are available. I could try to fit a quadratic um, uh, equation to the model. If I click on apply right here, uh, you know, kind of looking to see if there's any kind of nonlinearity going on. If I go back to linear right here, you can see the R square for a quadratic is 0.137. For a linear, it's 0.135. So that uh, little added um, uh, piece uh, using the quadratic really is just not justifying treating that relationship between interest and achievement as uh, nonlinear. So we're just going to stick with uh, assuming a linear relationship. But again, you can use uh, this fit line at total to kind of look for possible nonlinearities uh, in terms of the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable. And you can do that for each of these. So here's the um, partial regression plot uh, for engagement as the independent variable. And then we have for uh, anxiety. And then we also have for gender ID right there. So um, in a nutshell, you know, a lot of these these uh, subsequent plots that are provided, these are useful for evaluating different aspects 
of the model in terms of you know meeting assumptions and looking for nonlinearities and potential outliers. Going back to this table right here, the residual statistics, uh, you know, as I noted earlier, we had requested the unstandardized residuals. Uh, we also requested studentized residuals. We requested Mahalanobis distance and Cook's distance and so forth. And as I as I indicated before, I wasn't gonna, I'm not going to go into those exactly how to evaluate all those because I do have another video that addresses that. But um, if you look right here in this table, what it's giving you are minimum and maximum values for a number of these indices. So we have the unstandardized residual, the, the um, uh, standardized residual right here, there's studentized residual. Uh, you can see we have Mahalanobis distance and Cook's D right here. And so you can kind of look at the minimum and maximum values and sort of eyeball whether uh, whether we have values that fall outside of an acceptable range. And then from that, you can actually go into the data to identify those cases specifically that may uh, be representing a problem with respect to some of those indices. So I do include uh, links to the to uh, several videos on evaluation of assumptions, uh, including identifying outliers and in influential cases uh, in the PowerPoint presentation that I was uh, referring to earlier. So be sure to download that and you can go to those links to learn more about um, you know, uh, supplemental analyses to identify uh, potential problems with your regression model. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up this overview and I appreciate you watching.